Every phone is a gaming phone, really. I mean, even my LG G3 from six years ago plays Call of Duty Mobile, albeit on low settings, but it works. So is there really any point in buying something like the ROG Phone 5, a big, flashy, overclocked gaming phone, when any other flagship phone, like the Galaxy S21, which is powered by the same Snapdragon 888 chip, can play the same games? Well, yeah, I think so. I've been using the ROG Phone 5 for the last couple of weeks, and it's incredible, it really is. It is, without a doubt, the ultimate gaming phone. That doesn't mean it's perfect, but if you're an enthusiast or even a pro gamer, you're gonna have to buy one of these. With a huge 6.78 inch, 144 hertz screen, the Snapdragon 888, up to 16 gigs of fast RAM, and a massive 6,000 mAh battery. The specs alone are insane, but what really makes this stand out, for me at least, are the air triggers. I'm telling you, you can't go back to regular on-screen buttons after you've tried this. Plus the range of accessories, including the new ROG AeroCool 5, which just slots in beside the second USB-C port on the side, not only helps keep the phone cooler for longer gaming sessions, I mean you're literally sticking a cooling fan on the back of the phone, but it also gives you an extra two buttons you can assign. I would definitely recommend picking one of these up if you do go for an ROG Phone 5, and it is the only way to unlock the X Mode Plus option, which actually overclocks the chip. So the hardware is impressive, but it's also the software. We get Android 11, which can be as close to stock or heavily ROG customized as you'd like, and this new performance manager in the Armory Crate gives you a ridiculous amount of settings and options to tinker with. Clock speeds, frame rates, fans, game profiles, literally everything you could want is here. Or if on the flip side it all looks way too much, then you can just stick with the preset modes and maybe leave it on dynamic and then just never worry about it. It's not just the Armory Crate that gives you this over-the-top customization. In the regular phone settings, under the display options, you even get these animation speed settings which are usually hidden within the phone's developer options. I like to drop these down to 0.5 times to make everything feel a little bit snappier. Not that this phone really needs it. And the crazy thing is, it's not even that expensive. The ROG Phone 5 starts from 800 euros, uh, and you get 8 gigs of RAM with 128 storage, this guy with 16 gigs of RAM and 256 storage will save back a thousand euros, but that's not bad at all. Although bear in mind all the accessories, including the AeroCool fan, will cost you extra. And if you're wondering, didn't we just have the ROG Phone 3 last year? What happened to the 4? Well, in Chinese culture, the number 4 has some superstitious connotations with death. So uh, they just like to avoid that, so we've jumped right ahead to the Phone 5. Speaking of last year's ROG Phone 3, what kind of upgrades are we getting with the 5? Well, the headline is the upgrade from the A65 Plus to the 888 chip, which is about 10-15% to faster. We also now get a 16 gig of RAM option, up from 12, plus they've improved the cooling, both of the phone and also the new AeroActive cooler, and software-wise they've added this new performance manager in the Armory Crate. The screen's also slightly bigger, now at 6.78 inches, but we're getting the same 144Hz Full HD Plus AMOLED panel, and also the same 1 millisecond response time. Although the touch sampling rate is now 300Hz, up from 270, but you'd be hard pressed to notice. We also get the latest Gorilla Glass Victus on the front, and the slightly older Gorilla Glass 3 on the back. One downside though of the screen is that it's not an LTPO panel like you might get on the Galaxy S21 range. So uh, unlike the Samsung, which can actually adapt its refresh rate between I think 10 and 120 hertz. So based on what you're doing, it can change it and therefore save your battery. With this, you can choose between 90, 120 or 144. And on auto mode, it will switch based on what the app needs. But that's about it. It doesn't dynamically go all the way down uh, if you are on a sort of static screen to save battery. Although the always on display is set to 30 hertz. We're also getting the exact same 6,000 mAh battery, which is still huge, but crucially it's actually now split into two 3,000 mAh cells, and also supports much faster 65 watt charging, up from 30 watts last year. They've also improved the dual front-facing speakers. They sound absolutely incredible actually, and your hands don't cover them up, which is nice. Plus you have this 3.5mm headphone jack that supports high-res audio. Also, the inner nerd in me was quite excited uh, when they confirmed that this does support the latest Wi-Fi 6E, although you will need a compatible router or router for it. And of course, we're getting sub-6 5G support with this as well. So if you've seen or used one of the ROG phones before, then this cyberpunky design will be pretty familiar to you. 
This time we're getting it in Storm White or Phantom Black like I have here. The bezels are relatively chunky, but that does make it a little bit more comfortable to hold. Plus it leaves room for the bigger front firing speakers and also an LED notification light. Plus we're getting an optical in-screen fingerprint reader. Around the back, there's this glossy curved glass body. It's completely smooth, but with a textured look underneath. Refined, yes, subtle, not so much, with this giant ROG all-seeing eye on the back that lights up, although it can now display two colors at the same time for a gradient look. Jump into the armory crate and there's eight different lighting schemes and a full RGB color wheel. It is kind of silly. I mean, when you're actually using the phone, you can't see it, but it's a bit of fun, and who doesn't love a bit of go faster RGB in their gaming setup? And that's the point, this whole phone has been designed around gaming and using it in landscape mode. For example, the second USB-C port on the side means you can charge it or clip on accessories without anything getting in the way of your hands. In fact, this side port is USB 3.1 Gen 2, whereas the bottom one is a slower USB 2. Also, the front firing speakers, the layout of the quad microphones, and also the slightly offset selfie camera so your thumbs aren't covering it if you're streaming, it's all incredibly well designed. Now these aren't new, but one of the best parts of the ROG phone are the air triggers. Just swipe in to bring up the Game Genie, then tap on air triggers, and you can then customize how the two shoulder buttons will interact with your game. You simply drag the left and the right buttons on screen, so then as you press the air trigger, that then triggers the on-screen button. And in games like Call of Duty, where you can assign these to looking down the scope, or firing, or even reloading, it's so helpful. You can even split each button into a dual partition button, so you then have four shoulder buttons. Although this does halve the size of the button, which makes it a little bit trickier to tap. And if you pair these air triggers with the two extra buttons on the cooler, or even the extra rear buttons on the Pro and Ultimate models of the Origi phone, you've got so many ways of avoiding the on-screen virtual buttons. As for the camera, well, this won't take long. We get the same 64 megapixel Sony IMX 686 camera as last year, along with a 13 megapixel ultra wide, and everyone's favorite, a 5 megapixel macro. No telephoto lens, and using last year's sensor in the main camera, this is definitely the ROG phone's biggest letdown. And again, it just feels like an afterthought. Asus spent all of about 30 seconds talking about the camera in their briefing. They do say it's slightly improved from last year's phone, and in good light, the photos aren't bad, just a bit average, really. Although we do now get 8K video at 30 FPS, which is a nice extra, although I'm not sure how often you'd actually use that. It's tricky. I mean, I do appreciate that ASUS are putting all their efforts and resources into making the best gaming phone possible, but chances are, if you're gonna spend 800, 1,000 pounds or euros on this, it's probably gonna be the only phone you have in your pocket. So it is still quite important for the camera to be good. And so, yeah, I think this is probably the biggest issue I have with the phone. So there's room for improvement, but the priority here, of course, is performance. And importantly, sustained performance, thanks to the better cooling of the phone. This has a whole new thermal structure inside, where the hottest components are placed in the middle of the phone, and then the reshaped vapor chamber cooler and the graphite sheets help to then spread the heat evenly. But the question is, does any of this really make a difference to performance? Well, here's the results from a 20-minute 3 Mark wildlife stress test. On the left, just look at the S21 Ultra's lowest loop score and also its stability percentage, compared to the two ROG phone tests. You can see on the graph after loop 9 the S21 throttles, whereas both ROG phones give us much better sustained performance, particularly when you've got the Aeroactive cooler, where we see the highest 89.7% stability. It's so interesting, because the S21 Ultra I'm testing has the exact same Snapdragon 888 chip, but just look at that drop in performance by loop 12, which is the purple line between the two phones. The ROG, particularly with the fan, maintains a much higher frame rate for longer. So that's 3D Mark, but if we test the phones in Armor Mobile Ops, which is quite a demanding game and also supports high refresh rates, while we do see the occasional drop to zero on both during load screens, you can see there's far fewer drops in frame rate on the ROG. It's a much more stable frame rate, 98 versus 93%, and also because it's a 144Hz screen, we're actually seeing a slightly higher 126 median FPS. So obviously only a handful of games support higher 120Hz refresh rates and even fewer 144 to fully take advantage of this screen, but it's likely more will in the future, particularly esports titles. And on the other end of the spectrum, 60fps games with ridiculously demanding graphics like the new Genshin Impact also shows off the ROG's ability. And of course with this 6000mAh battery, 
I didn't feel like I had to ration how much I played when I was away from the charger. In fact, two hours of Call of Duty with maxed out settings at 50% brightness used 28% of the battery. So in real world, you can expect up to six hours of intensive gaming on this. All that's missing really is wireless charging, which is a bit of a shame. Now, if you are wondering what accessories work with the ROG Phone 5, it's a bit complicated. We have lost some support for older ones like the mobile desktop dock and also the TwinView Dock 3. I could see myself using the Kunai 3 gamepad from time to time, but I think for me, the only essential one is the Aeroactive Cooler 5. So you bring all that together, the sustained performance, the air triggers, uh, the active cooler, the super fast and responsive screen, it all adds up to make this an incredible gaming phone. Although I am keen to test this versus the upcoming Red Magic gaming phone as well, uh, so make sure you have subscribed so you don't miss that. My only complaint really with this is the camera. It's fine, it's usable, but it's not the best. But what do you reckon? Would you be tempted to buy one of these? And also, if you are into your mobile gaming, what are you playing at the moment? Let me know in the description below. And also, if you've got any other questions about this at all, I read all your comments, do let me know, and I'll do my best to answer them. If you do want to see more from me, then tap that subscribe button and ding that bell. And I'll catch you next time right here on The Tech Chat.